What I can say for sure though, is that I had a lot of fun once I got a grasp of the mechanics. So much so that Wolong Fallen Dynasty will be a day one buy for me. True to my word, I started my adventures throughout Wolong Fallen Dynasty the day it came out, and I've been eviscerating my foes ever since. Some of you have probably heard about the PC version of the game launching in rough shape, or plagued with glitches, but I can assure you things aren't nearly as bad as the articles make them out to be. Before we get into all that, however, let's have a brief look at the devs behind the game. Wolong Fallen Dynasty was co-developed by Team Ninja and Koei Tecmo. Koei Tecmo settled on their name in 2014 after the individual game companies Koei and Tecmo merged in 2009. Team Ninja was founded in 1995 as a subsidiary of Tecmo. Collectively, Team Ninja and Koei Tecmo as a whole are responsible for niche cult classic games such as all of the Dead or Alive games, all of the Ninja Gaiden games, and all of the Dynasty Warrior games, although Dynasty Warriors was more KT. Honorable mentions include Hyrule Warriors, the Neo games, the Atelier series, Stranger of Paradise, and last but not least, Wolong Fallen Dynasty. In the works now is the highly anticipated Rise of the Ronin, currently only confirmed for the PS5 and slated for a 2024 release. Koei Tecmo as a whole has a history long enough to warrant a video of its own, so that's about as in-depth as we're going to get today. I played the shit out of Neo 2, so when I played the demo for Wolong Fallen Dynasty, it felt a lot like coming home. The games functioned damn near identically, so the learning curve was nowhere near as steep as it would have been if I was brand new to the flow of the series. Actually, even if I didn't play Neo, there are major similarities in the lightning fast and viscerally brutal combat of the Ninja Gaiden games. All of that is a rather long-winded way of saying this game will test your reflexes if you don't come prepared. After you spend a considerable amount of time creating your character, finally, you're pushed into a tutorial area of sorts with an NPC ally showing you the ropes and sometimes serving as a helpful distraction. Once you reach the tutorial boss, the kid gloves are taken off. Way off. Once you finally beat him, you are ready for the rest of the game. That first boss, and by extension, the combat, is probably what's going to drive most players up the wall. It is unforgiving. This all might sound complicated, but I'll do my best to simplify things. Your bread and butter in this game, much like any other high difficulty RPG, is learning your opponent's moves. This is easier said than done, as most enemies use a combination of straightforward attacks, wind-up attacks, or fake-outs to bait you into making a misstep. First and foremost, the lock-on is your friend because the only thing more dangerous than a mutant Chinese tiger is a mutant Chinese tiger you've lost track of. Without a doubt, the enemy's movements or attacks will be focused on you 99.5% of the time, the other 0.5% being when the enemy randomly chooses to attack any allies that are with you. Your greatest defense against anything this game throws at you is your deflect. At roughly the exact moment an enemy's attack enters your personal space, you can use deflect to avoid damage. An enemy's basic attack combo will continue after you deflect one of its hits, so don't get too excited after your first successful deflection and then stop paying attention. On top of that, an enemy's basic attack combo has one or two variants, so it will not be the same string of attacks with the same timing every time. When enemies have had enough of your shit, they will use a critical blow, which is telegraphed by glowing red veins. These attacks hit extremely hard, so if you are looking to master the art of deflecting attacks, learn how to deflect those first. While fighting, take note of the gauge under the enemy's health. That is the spirit gauge, which is split into an orange left side, representing a negative amount of spirit, and a blue right side, representing a positive amount of spirit. Your goal in combat is, obviously, to kill the enemy, and the easiest way to do this is to fill the negative side of their spirit gauge. You have to deflect enemy normal attacks and critical blows, or use your own spirit to hit them with spirit attacks in order to fill the negative side of their spirit gauge and stun them. Once they are officially stunned, they will become defenseless, and the lock-on symbol will turn red, allowing you to perform a fatal strike, which deals a lot of damage. You only have until their spirit gauge's negative side empties to perform this attack, otherwise they will be back to normal and right back on you. This can be a pain in the ass if there are multiple enemies present, as they will keep interrupting you when you try to get close enough to initiate the fatal strike. If you use dodge unnecessarily or take damage from anything, that will fill your own spirit gauge's negative side and you'll become defenseless if you get struck again while your negative side is at its limit. 
Running away for a hot second is the best way to avoid that outcome, but is significantly harder to do if you're in a boss room. If you can't retreat, you can deflect, because successfully deflecting enemy attacks counteracts negative spirit. As I mentioned, the right side of the gauge measures your positive spirit. This is necessary to perform martial arts attacks provided by your equipped weapons, and spirit attacks that can stagger any non-boss enemy on impact, as well as greatly cut down the upper and lower limits of the enemy's spirit gauge, making it easier to open them up to fatal strikes. If your spirit gauge's negative or positive sides reach their limit, they will start to decrease after a few seconds, the rate of which is affected by your chosen virtues, which we'll get to in a bit. Just remember, build the orange gauge on your enemies and build the blue gauge on yourself. Most importantly, the backbone of your combat capabilities is deflection. You master that, you master the game. Now, if you only use deflect, battles will take forever. When you go on the offensive, what will you be attacking with? Just like in Neo, Wolong has a myriad of different usable weapons and mystical attacks, but your choice of virtue will dictate your attack options. Defeating enemies rewards you with the occasional item and genuine chi. Genuine chi is used to level up your character, with each level gain going towards one of the five virtues. Wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Virtues determine what weapons and spells you will be able to use effectively, as well as the functionality of your spirit gauge. A quick rundown. The wood virtue primarily raises your max HP and your spirit defense, which governs how much positive spirit you will lose when you are attacked. The fire virtue primarily affects the amount of spirit gained by attacking and the amount of spirit consumed by martial arts attacks. The earth virtue raises your equipment weight limit and the amount of spirit gained by deflecting. The metal virtue lengthens the amount of time you can maintain a high level of positive spirit before it starts to decrease and the amount of spirit consumed by wizardry spells. Lastly, the water virtue affects how stealthy you are and the amount of spirit consumed by deflecting. It doesn't look like deflection takes positive spirit, it just decreases your negative spirit, but we'll just assume the game is right. The five virtues affect quite a lot in terms of combat. For one, there are a whole lot of weapon types in this game, and their damage scales with one or more virtues, similar to scaling in a Souls game. A quick look at a weapon will show you which virtues provide the best attack bonuses, but for the best bonus, you should choose a weapon that does the most scaling with your main virtue. In my case, I have the most points in the fire virtue since my playstyle is offense oriented, followed by wood for extra HP and earth for a higher equipment weight limit. All that means is I seek out weapons that scale the most off fire and might have a secondary scaling in wood or earth. If you feel like this might limit your choice in weapons, it doesn't. Just playing the game will net you dozens if not hundreds of weapons and armor to sort through, and after completing a few chapters, you get the ability to reset your level and redistribute points into your virtues, so you are not hard locked into one style of play for the entire game. Next we have wizardry spells. Every four levels or so you will unlock one wizardry spell point to use to unlock one wizardry spell under each of the five phases. The word phase is essentially used in place of the word element, like you see in most other games. Spells in Wood Phase can conjure lightning, deliver buffs to you and nearby allies, or outright heal you. Spells in the Fire Phase can blanket the battlefield in flames and can buff damage. Spells in the Earth Phase are for all you tanks out there. You can conjure Earth Spikes to stun enemies, Mud Fields to slow them down, defensive spells to protect you from damage, and even shout at enemies to taunt them, giving your allies an opening to attack. Spells in the Metal Phase focus on debuffing the enemy, whether that be with penalties to movement speed, increased length of negative status effects inflicted on enemies, or damage over time from poisonous clouds. Last but not least, spells of the water virtue augment your stealth capabilities through short-range teleports or invisibility, and allow you to conjure ice spikes to launch at enemies from afar. This is serious deja vu, I feel like I just did a video on wizarding and spells. Anyway, wizard spells under any phase require you to be a certain morale rank, which we'll get to later and requires the corresponding virtue to be at a certain level in order to use them, so don't expect to be able to use ice and teleport around if your main virtue is fire. This is why choosing multiple virtues is ideal, but don't stretch yourself too thin, otherwise you won't be able to use any good spells from any phase. Each phase has divine beasts, which can buff you or attack for you once the divine beast gauge is full. Of course, a divine beast's power scales with their corresponding virtue, so you'll want to go with one that matches any of the virtues you have a good bit of points in. Since I have points in wood, I use Chin Long, which summons a circle that heals any ally standing inside it. It has saved my life many times, so I'll probably never use another beast. Back to weapons, there are 13 melee weapon types, and some scale better with certain phases than others. Looking at the weapon tooltip, 
you can see its rarity, upgrade value, and attack power right at the top, which are usually the first signs one weapon is better than another. Under that, we have the attack bonus, which shows how the weapon scales with certain virtues. Next, we have the martial arts attacks you can use with that weapon. If you flip the tooltip to the next page, you can see exactly how those martial arts attacks work. As far as I know, weapons drop with a random combination of martial arts and you cannot manually change them. At the very bottom of the tooltip are special effects provided by Jules, which I'll get into in a minute. As far as ranged weapons, you've got actual ranged weapons like a bow, a crossbow, and a repeating crossbow. Then, there are ranged items like throwing knives or bombs, which are great for getting a single enemy's attention. Headshots with bows or crossbows deal heavy damage, so don't be afraid to pick off some of the lesser enemies from a distance before charging in with melee. You've got four armor slots, and the armor tooltip looks mostly identical to the one shown on weapons, with a few key differences. There's a small symbol to the lower left of the armor piece's picture, which shows if this particular piece is light armor, medium armor, or heavy armor. Obviously, heavy armor provides the most defense, but its weight will slow you down tremendously if you wear a full set of it. Each armor piece clearly shows which phases it is resistant to, which leads us into the five phase affinities. The five phase affinities is the in-game application of the five phase theory. The theory basically says that everything in the universe is related in some way to one of five different natural phenomena, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Within Wo Long, they describe how each element interacts with one another. Their interaction should be taken into account when fighting certain bosses or particularly strong enemies. I use fire so any enemy using water can snuff out my fire wizardry spells immediately, causing me to fall back on my other spells from other phases, which is yet another reason why it's important to level multiple virtues. Phase interactions cannot cancel your divine beast attacks, however, so there's that. Lastly, in equipment you have accessories, which provide minimal additional bonuses to stats, and usable item slots, which house any items you feel you may need in the heat of combat, such as your dragon cure pot, which is your primary method of healing. After the first few chapters, you'll run into the blacksmith. She will reappear a few times with minimal functionality until you make it to the hidden village, a safe place that serves as the main hub and the place she chooses to set up a permanent shop. Once you speak with her there, you'll be able to utilize every service she has to offer. Upgrading is fairly straightforward. You can improve the defensive values of armor or improve the degree of scaling on weapons using steel or leather, respectively. Both materials can be found just about anywhere. Embedment allows you to use jewelry essence to slot special effect jewels into armor or weapons. Equipment can come with jewels already slotted, shown at the very bottom of the weapon or armor's tooltip. Salvaging lets you scrap all your unnecessary equipment and gain jewelry fragments or steel and leather. The decorate function is my favorite, and that allows you to change the appearance of weapons or armor to the appearance of any other weapon or armor you have ever owned, because I'll be the first to tell you, not all armor sets in this game look good. Lastly, there are the buy and sell functions, which are pretty self-explanatory. Selling will make you ridiculously rich after just a few missions, and buying lets you purchase basic items or very basic pieces of equipment. I believe her selection improves as the game goes on. In Wo Long, the story and its missions are divided into parts. If you choose, you can play the main missions consecutively from start to end, because the main missions neatly bookend into each other. Completing main missions also unlocks side missions within that chapter, which usually take you back to the areas from the main missions because some new threat has popped up, or NPCs you were nice enough to help out now want to fight you. Side missions are important to stay ahead of the curve, since you may be underleveled most of the time if you only do the main missions and nothing else. Once inside a mission, your mini-map will always have a red arrow pointing you toward the primary objective. It pays to explore a mission from top to bottom for several reasons. Items or treasure boxes are hidden throughout a mission and are usually worth seeking out. They could reward you with new equipment, upgrade materials to use at the blacksmith, or the items necessary to increase the number of uses or the healing effectiveness of your Dragon Cure Pod. If you look to the left of your minimap, you'll find other important reasons to thoroughly search missions. Your total number of marker flags, battle flags, and your fortitude rank. Your fortitude rank works hand in hand with your morale rank, shown just above your health bar. You see, every enemy will have a morale rank. Killing enemies raises your own morale rank, and having a morale rank at or higher than the enemy you are fighting means you will do more damage to them than they would to you. If you choose to try fighting an enemy four or more ranks above your own, there is a solid chance they will kill you in one shot. 
when you die your morale rank drops to whatever your current fortitude rank is and the morale rank of whatever killed you will raise marking flags raise your fortitude rank by one and battle flags raise it by two or three the enemy that killed you will also take half of your total genuine chi which is what you need to level up and if you die before killing the enemy that took it that chi is gone forever battle flags also serve as safe points allowing you to level up change your equipped divine beast change your equipped wizardry spells buy or sell basic supplies initiate online co-op call for npc ally reinforcements and receive deliveries such as special items courtesy of playing the beta demo or purchasing one of the special editions of the game resting out a battle flag replenishes your hp and dragon cure pot uses and also makes all enemies respawn simply planting the battle flag and not resting at it will heal you and not make the enemies respawn but you will only return to the last battle flag you rested at when you die so if you only rested at the first one and you died all the way near the boss room you're going to have a hell of a long hike ahead of you especially if you didn't open any shortcuts depending on the mission there are times where the game will shove an npc ally into your group to do the mission with npcs can be a great distraction they can call out treasure boxes if you're near one and there could be something valuable around here. and you can command them to use martial arts on enemies fighting alongside npc allies raises their oath level with you effectively making them more useful in combat if you don't want the hassle and would rather fly solo simply use the willow branch item to get rid of one or both npcs so you can go back to being a one man or one woman army accessing the online lobby allows you to recruit players to help you in a mission join the mission of another player to help them or invade players' games and try to kill them. You can opt out of invasions in the game settings, but every so often you will get invaded by an NPC as part of certain main missions. Not to worry, because an invading NPC is essentially just a particularly aggressive normal enemy that looks like a player. Co-op play has a level sync feature that sort of balances the levels of each character. That way a weak player doesn't get steamrolled by everything, and a godly player doesn't steamroll everything. It's a nice touch. Making it through the mission with your life intact as a helper grants you a sizable bounty of genuine chi and whatever items you happen to find, so it's definitely worth it to help other players out now and then. From day one, there was really only one glitch I encountered, and it was a periodic white flash that would see everything but the character models vanish. It never happened multiple times in rapid succession, so it was a real blink and you'll miss it type of glitch. I haven't seen that glitch since the patch on March 8th, so anyone sensitive to flashing patterns should be safe to play. Aside from that, I'm not sure I would call it a bug, but the control scheme is bad on keyboard and mouse. Well, why don't you just remap the controls, you probably asked. I would, except all the button tips shown are shown with PlayStation icons, so I'd have to smack random keys on my keyboard to figure out what does what, so I've just been using my Xbox controller to play. As far as my brain knows, I'm just using a weirdly heavy PlayStation controller. I also fell through the map once, but after a few seconds, the game put me back above ground, so there's that. Taking everything I've said today about Wolong Fallen Dynasty into account, I can't recommend it, nor can I really advise against it. It's not a bad game, quite the opposite in fact. It can be really fun once you get the hang of it. But everything it's doing, Neo 2 already did better, and in a more interesting setting. That's just my opinion anyway. I know I said I'd try to make the breakdown shorter, but the key word there is try. Wolong Fallen Dynasty is available now on the Playstations, the Xboxes, and PC. The Steam version is currently 17% off on Green Man Gaming, so check the link in the description. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you want to see more. This has been Cygnus Jason, and I will see you on the front lines.